Wrestler fans around the corner and around the world, I'm the Big Fat Well. And I'm the rocker, Marty Jannetty. And in about 10 seconds, we'll be talking about 90s wrestling straight out of Melrose. Uh, it's going to be a rocking... Who we'll let the little kids into the studio? Cut! Cut! Wrestling fans, now you too can look as cool as Monty and the Pharaoh by wearing the official Monty and the Pharaoh sunglasses at night for $8.99 each. That's only $8.99 each. Now available at MontyandthePharaoh.com. Punk. What? Yeah. No, I'm... Yeah, I'm behaving myself. No, I'm not playing in abandoned buildings. What? Again? Now. I suppose you had those people follow me again. Okay. Fine. Hey, this is Jimmy Farrow from Monty and the Farrow, and I want to thank all our subscribers. We have now passed 14,000 on our YouTube channel. But I want to ask our subscribers to take the next step for us and become a full-fledged member of Monty and the Farrow. Yeah, that's right, folks. There's three different levels to choose from. There's free shirts, there's free autographs. Just check it out and become a member of Long Island's number one pro wrestling broadcast, Monty and the Pharaoh. Later. Boston wrestling is fake news. Hello, this is WWE Hall of Famer, Mr. USA, Tony Atlas. And once again, I'm here to tell y'all a little bit about uh, being a wrestler back in the older days. Why don't you tell them where we are, brother? We're out right of now, noise. Right We're now, Larry, you know there's a lot of talking. Larry, just remember where I'm at. Sometimes I forget where the hell I'm at. But right now, we're at uh, the celebration 
Uh, the first Comic Con done at the Ramada Inn, Perry and Lewis Domain, right here on Pleasant Street. We got uh, people from Marvel Comics and DC Comics all here selling their merchandise. I just got through selling a couple of merchandise. So this is the first Comic Con that they did here at Celebration, right here in Lewis Domain at the uh, Ramada Inn. You know, I was talking earlier in, in some earlier shows to be a wrestler back in my day. It took more to, to just be a wrestler. I mean, they, we had a lot of guys that were big and strong, uh, tough guys, could wrestle anywhere, could do anything. But when you put the name on the billboard, they didn't draw money. Then when you put Huck Hogan name on the billboard, he drew money. It was just something about people like Huck Hogan that really, really had what you call drawing power, the power to draw fast. Not mean that Hogan was not a good wrestler, that Hogan was not good at at, uh, at, at, at what he did. In, in fact, he was a good wrestler, but he had some, he had a little bit extra. You take like a Dusty Roll for example. Dusty Roll didn't do no drop kicks. Dusty Roll didn't do no head scissors. Didn't jump off the top rope. But Dusty Dusty Roll could draw more people to an arena than what a Ray Mysterio of the day do. And Ray could do everything in the world, but he didn't have the drawing power or the charisma that a Dusty Rhodes had, or like what I uh, saying earlier, like uh, what uh, a Hulk Hogan uh, would particularly have. And one of the things that are uh, about wrestling that made it that way, everybody had a different character. I mean, you know, you must, you must hear me say this a thousand and one times. We was crazy as hell. Well, I want to take that back we were not crazy as hell. We are crazy as hell. There were things that I did that I knew was crazy, and I, for some odd reason, I ain't stopped yet, Larry. I still do crazy things because a wrestler, he would wake up the next morning. Like I said, we didn't have entertainment back in the day. We didn't get to go to movies. We didn't get to go to watch television. We didn't get to go to the park. We didn't go and do the this super thing that people did because we had to create our own entertainment. Well, I hear CM Punk talk about it. I hear it, uh, what is his name, Honky Talk Man talk yeah, about it. Yeah. I, I hear a lot of wrestlers from the time talk about one thing. And the one thing they all used to talk about is Tony Abbott having a foot fetish. First of all, I do not have a foot fetish. Let's get it straight. The guy said, oh, we're totally like girls in high heels. When I see a woman in high heels, what I think about is going to church because I'm raised up in the country. So the only time a woman put on a pair of high heels in my day was she went to church. So when I see a woman in high heels, I think about going to church. Now, some of the things that they said that I do was not true. I mean, it make a good story, as uh, Matt Dog Bashan would say. If a story is worth telling, it's worth embellishing. Tony Atman's main thing was not high heel. Tony Atman's main thing was what? Sneaker. There it is right there. And like I said, you have to be tough. I didn't just look at the sneaker. The sneaker didn't just, you know, just step on me. What I used to do, I'd get them come to the room. I don't y'all get scared now. And give it to me, girl. Boom, 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 boom. Ain't that wonderful? Woo! <laughs> oh, I'm gonna give you some more of that. Yo, hold on. She's gonna do it again. Now watch it. Give it to me. Boom, 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 boom. Woo! Now, I don't want none of y'all get jealous out there. I want all y'all to go home. Don't worry. Look at you. <laughs> don't worry about it, Tony. No, I won't be jealous. I want y'all to go home. I want all y'all to go home. Get your wife some nice sneakers now. You can't get her any type of sneaker. You have to get the special sneaker there. We're going to put them up there. You've got to have these here. You see that? These are the sneakers you got to have right here. And with these, she could stomp on you. She could punch you in the jaw. She could step on you. These are the sneakers. Look at them one. See, that's one leg. Now look at the other one. Two of them. See, that? they ain't that pretty. Have you ever seen anything look so good? Now, these sneakers here are for one reason. And one reason on it, they is for giving you a ah ah ah. See that? Look at that. Oh boy, 
Woo! Don't wear those. <laughs> you don't now wear you know. Street, do you, Tony? No, you don't wear them in the street now. No, 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 no. These shoes never seen the outside door. Because once you get on the outside, you know, you get kicked in the face. But, you know, when you lift the shoe off, you got dog poop. <laughs> <laughs> Rocks and gravel and everything else in the, in, in your face, but that was something I always enjoy. I'm not ashamed of it. At one time, I used to hide. A lot of guys would hide what they like, and the thing about pro wrestling did for me, especially, they made us be a little bit open about who we are. You know, you hear a lot of stories. If I hear this guy used to do this, I hear this guy used to do that, and this and that. But here in today's time, things are better now. Uh, in some way, not in all ways. I mean, you can't make jokes like we did back in the day, but in some way, things is a lot better because people are a little bit more open about what they like, and, uh, and they're more tolerant. And, 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 yeah, and, and, and people are more tolerant. I was reaching out there, I can't think of his name, but with this one wrestler, I used to wrestle with him in 2008. And then a guy showed me something on the computer the other day Rex Tyler. Rex Tyler? Well, he was a big, strong, six foot four, built guy, Rex Tyler, uh, had a dreadlock. Oh, yeah. Tyler Rex. Tyler Rex. I'm yeah. sorry, Tyler Rex. Well, now he just came out and, you know, he's a transgender. But during the time, like during the time where Pat Patterson was wrestling, Pat Patterson could not come out and tell the general public that he was, he was gay. It was like they pick a certain image of a wrestler. And being gay was not an image that uh, the promoter wanted to uh, uh, wanted to promote. So he, for years and years and years, Pat had to keep this a secret. Then in Legend House, which a lot of the wrestlers already knew, but in Legend House, Pat finally came out and and explained about what uh, about what he what you know what he what he was all about, which I had no problem with. And that was a good thing about being a pro wrestler in, in my time. We all had our hangs up. Man was a sleeker. Another guy was high heel. Another guy just had, you know, everybody has something that they like. And we would ride up down the road. We would talk about it. Like I would be riding with, with SD Jones. And SD was funny. I love him. SD was coming in. Hey, boss man. Boss man. Boss man. Look. Look at the shoes, boss man. Look at the shoes, boss man. She got the nice shoes. She got the nice shoes. You like the shoes, boss man? Yeah, yeah, boss man. Boss man. That was S.D. Joe. <laughs> you don't say. Pat saw Jim Duggar. He used to come up and say, "Hey, you don't want to. You don't want to take your shoes off wearing that guy." So all the guys had different things that they liked. But, but the thing about being a wrestler, nobody criticized nobody because everybody had their own little hang up, their own way of entertaining. Another guy, he may go back to the room at night, get a fifth, get a fifth of, 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 of whiskey, and he would drink whiskey. And eat cheese and uh, stuff like that. Another guy was into drinking wine. Another guy was into drinking beer. Just about everybody drinks something. But nobody made fun of you for what you did. So it gave us a chance to be more and more open. And I think what that did would help us to get into our character more. Because I asked the promoter a long time ago. I said, what image, what, what gimmick should I get? He said, Tony, just give it time, you would come into your own. Like, of all the people that was born on this planet, from the beginning of time, there have never been one person to have the same fingerprint or the same DNA. And we used to say wrestling is the only sport on the earth that is for real. What we meant by that, our character was not... Hey, if you ever meet Ric Flair, I say this a thousand times, the same Ric Flair you saw on television, that was the same Ric Flair we saw in the dress room, the same Ric Flair we saw at restaurant. He became that character. He became Ric Flair. People ask me in the gym, because I still lift pretty heavy, Tony, why you lift such heavy weight? Well, that's Tony Adams. I told him, I said, I got to be Tony Adams. I can't come to a, a wrestling event without the gun. They're not as big as they used to be, but people expect to see Tony Atlas 
with the gun. That's what people expect to see. They want to see some muscle on me. They don't want me to show up and have absolutely no muscle. That's my character. I'm, I'm, I'm being myself. You take like the free bird. They didn't act. Andre the Giant was his character. Andre did not uh, fake who he was. The Muda, that was her. She didn't fake who she was. Even the Ultimate Warrior. If you met the Ultimate Warrior in uh, uh, in wrestling, if you met the Ultimate Warrior out of wrestling, he was the same person. He was the same person that 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 you saw in the arena. Nothing changed about these guys. Today, what have changed is that you have the the wrestler, but they are not able to be themselves. You have a a, a writer that they would call. And they would write the strip of how they want you to be. They would tell you how to wrestle. They tell you how to talk. And when I got with Marty and the Farrell, I said, Marty, what I like to do is do the interview, do a, a talk show the way we did it when wrestling was wrestling. The voter would come out and say, Tony, I want you to uh, do a 30-minute promo. You're going to wrestle. He'll be Larry Hunter. And that's all he would tell me. Then I had to get out there and, and, and just just cut a promo. You know, just right off the top of my head. There was no paper, no script, no nothing. I'd have to just do this 30 minute promo so I would come out and Larry Huntley, you let me tell you something. I wrestle all over the United States. I wrestle all over the world. And let me tell you something, brother. You're a tough guy, you won a lot of matches, you defeated a lot of great wrestlers. But when I get you in Madison Square Garden on the thirtieth of this month. I'm going to give you the wrestling lesson of your life. Boom. That was it. The motor would say, oh, great. Put it in the can. And that's how we used to do our interview. Now, if I should go back to WWE, they give me a piece of paper. They say, Tony, this is what I want you to say. Then I would get in the ring. They would say, Tony, this is not what I want you to do. In my day, they said, Tony, you're going to wrestle against the Undertaker. We want 15 minutes out of it. And Undertaker is going to go over. Going over means he's going to win. I said, okay. So me and Undertaker, we don't have a word between us. He's in one dressing room, I'm in the other dressing room. So we, it's impossible for us to communicate with each other. We can't communicate with each other. So what we have to do is, uh, when we get in the ring, we did what you call ad lib. You, you do it as, as you go. But it was three people involved. I wouldn't say people. It was the, the two wrestlers and the audience. And what we did back in the old days, we tried to get the audience to participate, become part of the match. That's why we did old tricks like a guy would pull my hair. Well, not now he won't pull my hair. He'd pull my beard now. But back then, when I had hair, a guy would pull my hair. I would get up. Said, referee just got pulled my hair. And then he pulled my hair again. I would come up and I would draw back. But before I punch him, I would turn to the people and say, Should I hit him? The people would say, if I get a third of the people go, Yeah, I hit him. So I wouldn't hit him. Only a third want me to do it. So then he pulled me down again. I get up again. Should I hit him? Then I got half of the people said, Yeah, I hit him. So I go back down again. The third time I come up, for some reason, everything worked good on three. I was saying, should I hit him? Almost the whole audience said, hit him, hit him. Then I nailed it. By doing that, we got to cheer every time because I involved the people uh, uh, in the match. You know, we should get the people involved. Like the bad guy would come out, like George Two-Turn hair. He would come out, and the place is so quiet. You can hear a rat piss on cock. I mean, this quiet, 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 almost like being in church. Old George Harris would go over to the ring, go to, oh, shut up out there. Ain't nobody saying nothing. He would holler, shut up out there. When soon as he says, shut up out there, the whole place, because he's the bad guy, they wasn't going to listen to him. So they started cheering. Then before he told me, shut up, they started talking. So wrestlers knew the ways of getting the people involved uh, in the match. And that's what made wrestling so much different than what it is now because it took the involvement of the fan. We just didn't go out there and just did our own thing and didn't think about how the fan felt about it. So you had to work 
in my day, you had to work with the people, you know. And some of the guys sometimes didn't learn how to do that. And he was a guy that really didn't draw a lot of money. But like what Huck Hogan would do when he get ready, he feel the people want to cheer for him. He would just walk over. The first guy I see doing it was Dusty Rhodes. The first guy I saw done this, but I'm going to show you now, was Dusty Rhodes. Dusty Rhodes would put his hand like this. Go to this crowd and go to this crowd. And every time we do that, these people would cheer, these people would cheer. And then he would do both arms, and the whole place would cheer. Now once you get all the all the people to all the people to cheer like that, what Dusty would do, that's when he would do his thing. So now he got the people involved. He got the people behind him. And that's what made the dress a little bit more entertaining, where the people could become part uh, part of the show. And today, everything, like I said, is done by writers. They go to college, they get a degree in, in, in different creative writing. creative writing and stuff. <laughs> and then they would come to me. They won't talk to me about anything. So my character would never get to be uh, uh, involved uh, uh, in the match now, you know. So a lot of guys, they have different ways of getting themselves over with the people. One of the hardest gimmicks in pro wrestling to do, probably right now today, was uh, wearing a mask. Because if uh, if somebody got an arm on me, I could sell it with my face. My face is pressed. Like, ah, 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 ah. I could show the people I'm in pain through my facial expression. Now if you wear a mask, a guy is, is, is doing your arm, you don't have the facial expression. That's been eliminated. So wrestlers that wear a mask, they have to sell with their body. One of the best in my day was a wrestler called Mr. Wrestling Number Two. I uh, used to wrestle in, in a rubber man, uh, uh, Johnny Walker. And he was, uh, what do you call it there? Where you go real flexible, double joint. Oh, yeah. Like double joint. I mean, he could put his legs behind his neck. You know, he would just double joint. You could twist his arm all the way around. It wouldn't hurt him because, you know, he would have called double joint. Well, he wrestled for years and years and years as, um, as, as Johnny Rubberman Walker. Johnny Walker. And then he got this break in Georgia where he's going to wrestle Tim Woods, who was Mr. Wrestling number one. And they brought Mr. Wrestling number two in to be a bad guy, heel. Well, what ended up happening, he, he got his break by accident because what ended up happening was Wrestling 2 uh, got unmatched by a fan accidentally. He got his finger bit on, which right away they started pushing Wrestling 2. But it, he was in later years when he got his break. He was almost in his late 40s or so, you know, when, when he got his first break in uh, 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 pro wrestling. So sometimes a wrestler would get his break very early, like I did. You know, I was very lucky that uh, uh, two years into the business, I was what you call the main eventer. Wrestling too was in the business for 12, 12 years before he got his break. Taz, Tasmania, 14 years before he got his break. So, Tasmaniac. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, by the time he got his break, he was in the business for about... Uh, 15 years. Uh, Tommy Dreamer, uh, he didn't get his break right off the bat. He was in the in the business for five or six years, maybe even as long as 10 before ECW came along. We got his break because I met Tommy Dreamer back in the late the late 80s, early 90s. We were working for ICW, International Championship Wrestling. And he was on his, his way up. Him and uh, uh, the Patriot. Uh, uh, Tom Brandon and uh, the Tasmania with him, him and his brother, and these guys were trying to make a reputation of himself. You take Cactus Jack, he didn't get a break right off the bat. He, you know, he wrestled three or four years before he even uh, got a break, uh, got his first break. But uh, uh, I wrestled him in 89, and then about two or three years later, he went to uh, WCW and became a big star as, as Cactus Jack. So for some wrestlers, they call them like shooting stars. They go to the top of the top of the heat uh, right away. Then you got other wrestlers that they take years and years and years and years and years from the top. Hulk Hogan, for example. I wrestled Hulk Hogan in the in the late in the late seventies, seventy eight, 
no break. 79, no break. 1980, no break. He didn't get his break until the, uh, the rocket movie came out. He went for what? 82? 82 or something. So, you know, when you look at old, I could probably lay that 85 or something. Yeah. No, he was a champion in 82 because me and Rocket won the belt then. Backer was still champion. But me and Rocket won the belt in 82. Yeah, but, but yeah, he was there, but he was, he was putting over. I know I beat him in 81. No, no, no. He won the AWA and was a break there. Yep. And then Vince hired him in 83. 83, yeah. So, so see, uh, 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 it, he, it took it took hold of a while to get to where that Randy Savage, even though his, his father um, was a, a, a big, big star for many, many years, Randy didn't get his break until the late 80s, early 90s. And he was around for years and, and years and years. I even got a a, 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 a booklet I was looking at, the Georgia Championship Wrestling, where Randy Savage was a preliminary guy. He was on the bottom of the on the bottom of the car, you know, and and, and I see guys that Dino Brown and all these guys, it was like in the in the seventies, these guys was like on the bottom. So it took a rest of five it was between five and ten years before they became a main inventor. As I said earlier, I was kind of lucky because of my physique. The promoter started pushing me to the top at a very, very uh, young age. So if you got my book, I put in my book, uh, Too Much Too Soon. That came from a, a wrestler by the name of Wahoo McDaniel. Uh, George Scott was talking about making me Mid-Atlantic champion. I've only been in business for three years. They want to make me champion. And uh, Wahoo said, you're pushing them too fast, George. You're giving them too much too soon. Most of the time before a wrestler made it, oh, they made over a thousand dollars. They have been wrestling for three or four years before they start making that type of money. I made fifteen hundred dollars my first week as a pro wrestler. And that was my smallest week. So in other words, I got spoiled. Everything came to me so easily that I started taking things for uh, I took it for granted, to be honest with the people out there. And, uh, I didn't uh, appreciate it because it, came, it just came too quickly. I mean, two years in the business, by 1976, 77, I was a main event. And I worked main event my whole, everywhere I went. I walked into Texas, I'm a main event. California, main event. AWA, main event. NWA, main event. WWWF, main event. And where I went, it was always, uh, I was always, you know, top of, top of the car. And I feel over the years, it may have called, in fact, I know it did call a lot of animosity among wrestlers that have paid their dues. Imagine you work a job for 10 years. You, you're at work every day. You know the program. You, you're never late. You never complain. All of a sudden, one day, this young kid walks through the door and becomes your boss. He don't know how the system works. He don't know anything about the job. You got all this experience, put in all the time. We hit this kid and get this nice fat check. And you've been around all the time busting your butt. And you didn't get the promotion that you probably felt you rightfully deserved. Well, wrestling is no different than any other job. There was a lot of wrestlers that I know for a fact, they told me out of their own mouth, that they, they had some uh, animosity uh, towards me because they felt that I didn't earn, uh, earn the title. In fact, I hear talk in the dressing room about Hulk Hogan when they made Hogan uh, the champion after all these years. They said, well, there's a lot of other guys. What about Jimmy Snooker? What about Pedro Morales? What about this guy? They started naming all these all these other guys that should have been been there. But the problem with me, Jimmy Slipper, and all the guys, we was good draw. I mean, we drew good money. But we couldn't sell our every arena. We couldn't put the butts in the seats like uh, Hogan could. We didn't have the charisma that Hot Hogan did. I hear people talk about... Uh, Dusty Rhodes, because Dusty Rhodes was, you know, was a chubby guy, you know, he, you know, he had no built, no muscles or nothing, but when you put Dusty Rhodes on the car, especially in Florida and Georgia, down south during that time, 
I mean, y'all saw him up here on the WWF, but I knew Dustin before that was the, the end of the road. Yeah, that was the end of uh, Larry Man. That that was the end of our uh, of our Dustin career. But if you ever saw Dustin in a Church Funk or Harley Race, even Rick Flair, if you ever saw Rick Flair in his heyday, the first question that came to your man was Rick Flair was the greatest wrestler, greatest entertainer of all time. There was nothing Rick Flair could not do in the ring. And outside the ring, you know, he he was tough. You know, one thing I say a thousand times, I can get in a fight with Larry Huntley. Larry is a wrestler. If I lose a fight with Larry Huntley, there's no big deal. But if I got in a fight with a wrestling fan or a spectator and I lose the match, the promoter will fire me. Because people are seeing us as being the toughest guys walking the face of the earth. You know, we were looking at that being big, rugged, tough, a killer Kowalski, Ox Baker. You know, these guys, they even look like monsters. You know, Mad Dog Rashawn, you know, you know, these guys, Bob Orton Sr. You know, they was like rugged guys. So when they see a wrestler, the first day they thought, you don't want to fight a wrestler. He's a professional wrestler. You don't want to fight him. So the last thing a wrestler want to do is get into a fight with a guy that's not a professional fighter and lose a match. It's kind of like Mike Tyson going to a bar and getting beat up by the by the bouncer. I mean, it's very hard to call Mike Tyson heavyweight champion of the world when there's a bouncer, <laughs> you know, in Lewis of Maine that can whoop his butt. Well, the same thing in wrestling. It was very hard for me to be Mid-Atlantic champion or WWE tag team champion with the Rock Father, Rocky Johnson, and then go to a local bar and get whooped. So what I did, I made sure that I kept myself in the best shape possible. I made sure that there was nobody stronger than me. And how, what I used to do to make sure that, that my strength was more than other people's strength, what I would do is I would compete against other athletes. So when most wrestlers would go to the gym and work out, I would go to the gym and work out, but then I would look on, they used to put these uh, flyers up on the wall. So I look on the wall and I would see, oh, they're going to have the New York Powerlifting Championship. I'm going to go to that. See, I never trained for a contest. Never trained for a contest. I stayed in shape year round. I was like a, a early version of, of uh, Tom Brady. Brady is the way Brady is. Brady never let Tom Brady get out of shape. In the off season, Tom Brady works out. A lot of athletes they would take they would take the off they would take the the off season off and just relax and then they come when they get close to season they would work to get back into shape. A lot of bodybuilders would let themselves get out of shape, not totally out of shape, but then when it come contact they would get in shape for it. A lot of power they started training for contact. These I would go into town on a Friday. The poster be up on the wall. It's a contest Saturday. I would sign up that Friday to compete the next day. Because every day I went to the gym, every Monday and every Thursday, I did bench press. And I would take 500 pounds. And I would try to get as many reps as I can. The most I ever did, I used to do 500 for five reps. Then I rest for two minutes. Do it for another five rep, and I would try to get 25 reps with 500 pounds. Now I started moving up later in my career, where I would go up to 550 and get three to four reps with 550. When I was able to get five reps with, with uh, uh, 550, that's, that's when I started going to a contest. But I knew as long as I was able to do 500 pounds for reps, I could win most any powerlifting meet I went to. Back in them days, if you bench press 500 pounds, that was a lot of weight because they didn't have shirts. Now you see they got the lifting shirt. Now I was in a contest here in Lewis and Maine. In fact, it was right here in this building where we're at now at the Ramada Inn. Russ Barlow, the local promoter and the local uh, power lifter here, he put on a contest. And I was lifting against a guy. The first attempt, I did 500 pounds. Where the guy who lifted against me, he did 500 pounds. Then we went to 550. I did the 550. 
the guy that was with me, he took the 550 off, he brought it down, his shirt ripped. The weightlifting shirt. Did you wear one? I never wore a shirt. Okay. I never wore a shirt. His shirt lifted. So now he got a lift without the, the bench press shirt. He bring that weight down. That weight never left his chest. See, these shirts, if you got like a 500 pound bench with the shirts, you could do maybe anywhere between 50 to 100 pounds more than what you could do. They assist you. In fact, some of the shirt, a guy bought a shirt one time and had me to help the spot him. He had 400 pounds on. He take the 400 pounds off, he bring it down to here. The weight won't go down no more. He had to pull it down to the chest. We had to, I had to push the weight down to the chest. Because the shirt is so tight, it, it, couldn't, it couldn't touch the chest. Couldn't touch it. But if, as soon as you put it down to the chest, pop up. What I from from here to here, you not lifting. This is how much you not lifting. So you got a shirt on. This is all the lifting I do. That's the lift. The shirt is doing the rest. Then it came out with a squat suit, where as the lower you go, the tighter the suit gets. We give you resistance to come up out of that pocket. I never used none of that. I used to lift in a tank top, so I did all my benching raw. Now, I probably could have done over 700 pounds if I used a shirt. But I always felt if you use a shirt, you didn't lift that. Not all of it. You take guys, Ted R.C., they did 700 pounds. But I worked out with Ted R.C. His maximum bench without a shirt was a little bit over 600. But with that shirt, he could do 100 pounds more with that shirt. I always felt that that, that, that was cheating. Guys used to wrap the knees and wrap the elbows. And we used to call all that stuff. We, we call all that stuff cheating. We said that that, that person is cheating if, 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 because you're using it in a you know using a system. So that's how come I was able to compete in both wrestling, bodybuilding, and powerlifting all at the same time. At the beginning, around September, the beginning of the year, I was going to a powerlifting contest. But then I would bulk up to put on the side. And then, when I feel myself getting too bulk, I look for a bodybuilding contest to go to, and I would go on a six-week diet. And, and for six weeks before the contest, all I would eat is meat, veggies, and fruit. No pasta, no rice, no... If it wasn't green, I wouldn't eat it. I ate salads, I ate collard greens, I had kale, green beans, cabbage, it curry. But I wouldn't eat potatoes. I wouldn't eat a potato. I buy it. It was too much yeah, oh, yeah. you get it's carbs in everything you eat. So I would not eat no uh nothing that that, that, that was fat. And the only liquid that I used to drink, I had my coffee in the morning and all day long the only thing I would drink was water. I love my beer. But if it's a bodybuilding contest coming up, the one thing I wouldn't do is drink beer. I wouldn't drink. I wouldn't drink no beer because that beer would put that water weight on me and everything, and, and I didn't want that water weight on me. So I, you get, it was very, very strict. Now after the contest was over, believe it or not, what I had after every bodybuilding contest, a bottle of beer, no, no banana split. <laughs> That was my reward. When I won the Mr. USA contest, went out to this diner, <laughs> and we had banana split. And that's what we used to get all the time when we wanted to, when we wanted to, to, uh, 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 to bulk up. Because you started craving it. You have a craving for all this stuff. That's why even now, I don't know if they still do it, but a lot of the bodybuilders, then we have what you call the, uh, 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 a junk food day, you know, a, a day of nothing, nothing but junk food. So we would go out, we go to McDonald's, we go to Burger King, we go everywhere we get everything that is fat. A lot of ice cream you get put away with a lot of cake, you know, and we just would scoff down. But then we do that for about a day or two, but then it's right back to the resume. When I was traveling with Rocket Johnson, Rocket Johnson was in very good shape too. He was also 
uh, into bodybuilding and, and, and heavy lifting. We used to go to like Kentucky Fried Chicken and we ordered chicken breast and we would pull the skin off of it. Pull all the skin off of it and just pull the white meat out of it. And all we ate was uh was the white meat of of the chicken or something like that. Alvin Husky. He would get a dozen of eggs and ball them. A dozen of ball eggs. Kill around his bag and out. And he would take the egg, open it up, take the yolk out, throw the yolk away, and just eat the white part of the egg. Then another thing we did was eat the tuna fish. We buy that tuna fish that in water, you know, not in the oil, and, and not, and no salt on it. We take that tuna fish and we eat that tuna fish straight out, straight out of the can. So it was either meat. I used to have a steak every morning. Every morning I'd have a T-bone steak. Then I would have my egg whites and T-bone steak. That was my breakfast. And then I made myself a big bowl of fruit. I cut up cantaloupes and everything else in that in that bowl. And that was and, and that was what I had. And then and then for lunch we would have tuna fish, uh, chicken, and a salad. For dinner, it was pretty much the same thing: chicken or turkey. I used to like turkey at the end of the day because with turkey. Uh, you, for some reason, you get sleepy with turkey. It's something in turkey that makes you sleep. I can't think of the name of it right now, but if you ever know it's after Thanksgiving dinner, you feel like going to sleep. Uh, turkey will make you sleep. So I try not to eat turkey during the day because it make you make you sleep. But our diet was very, very uh, important. You know, what you put into the body is going to show uh, how, the, how the body looks. Now, on a swallow nigga, he would go to the butcher. He'd go to the butcher. And he would buy a steak and have them to grind the steak stuff. And he made his own hamburger. So, and, and, and that's what, what our armies would do. I was, uh, I, I worked out with Charles Glass, Mike Christian. I never trained with Arnold Schwarzenegger, but what happened was I trained at Gold Gym. Well, for y'all, they don't know nothing about body, the Gold Gym started with a guy called Joe Gold. Joe Gold started uh, World Gym. I mean, Gold Gym. Well, when he sat, when he sat over to Pete Gronkowski, the deal was that he could not open another gym up using the name Gold. So Joe Gold started World Gym. As an honor went to World Gym when he worked out on town. He would come by, go, say hi to everybody, you know, make jokes. And everything. He, he, had, he was a good nature guy, very good nature guy. He loved to laugh and joke, so he, so he was kind of like Muhammad Ali. You know, Ali likes to joke a lot and make jokes. You know, make people laugh. And Arnold Schwarzenegger is just like Muhammad Ali. They, they love to make people happy. So he would do anything to bring a smile on your face or, or, to, make you, uh, or, or to make you happy. And uh, I learned a lot from these guys over the years. I just wish that a lot of stuff that I learned, I, I learned earlier in my career. Like I always had a hard time developing my calves. So I asked Arnold one time, how did he develop his calves? He said, Tony, if you notice, your calves push up all day long. They push up. They do concentric movement. When you push it, that's concentric. When the weights are coming for you, that E center, negative. He said, try doing negative. So you go up on your cab, you hold it for two seconds. You take six to eight seconds coming down. So you come up at any speed you want, but you come down slow. Well, my calves within a year went from 16 and a half inches to 18 inches around. Which for my height, that was still a small calf. But I had like 30 inch, 30 inch thighs that time. Had a 32 inch waist, a 60 inch chest, and 23 and a half inch arm. And then when uh, what did came into bodybuilding, the guy was Frank Zane. Frank Zane was the name. He bought what you call uh, symmetry into into bodybuilding. See, before Mike Zane, they would judge you on each body part. So they come out and they would judge you on that chest. Then they would judge you on best back. So everybody come out and do chest poses. Then they say, okay, 
they write down who got the best chest. Then everybody would do a back pose. Then they write down who got the best back. Then they had the best arm. In fact, superstar Billy Graham in the Mr. America contest, he won best arm in the Mr. America. And then they would do best legs. Then they would do most muscular. Most muscular. But not trying to blow my own horn. In every contest I end up, I won best arm, best chest, best back, and most muscular. So I had four. I won four divisions. So the only thing left was best legs and best ass. I had a contest. But then when Frank Zane came into bodybuilding, everything had to be symmetrical. So if you got 20 inch arms, you got to have at least 19 or 20 inch calves. If you had a 60 inch chest, you have to have 30 inch thigh. So the bottom, the bottom had to match the top. Now one of the guys that I thought, he did did a little bit of him, and I thought he could have been Mr. Olympia if it had been for his wrestling career, was two guys. One who was, was big, powerful, but also symmetrical, of course, was the ultimate warrior. The warrior of the body matches his lower body. And you look at Lex Luger. Lex Luger was another one. His upper body matches his lower body. Now, Albert Pusky had a great body, but if you ever met him in person, his leg was much bigger than his upper body. He didn't have the big arms to match his leg. You know, he had a, a great upper body, but his lower body was, you know, you know, his legs were like tractor tires. So he had like 21, 22 inch calves, but he had like a 16 or 17 inch bicep. So it didn't, it didn't matter. Uh, bodybuilding was hard to get into wrestling back if you were a bodybuilder. Because there was a perception that if you had muscle, you were muscle bound. You couldn't move around the ring, you, you, you use your flexibility. So a lot of the wrestlers, as, as me and Larry talked about on earlier shows, didn't do weight training. They did what they would call calisthenics. They did a lot of push-ups, a lot of free squats, a lot of setups, a lot of running. And, with, and, the only, and they did pull-ups. A lot of pull-ups. And these were pretty much as close as you got to, but they didn't do resistant exercise. Because they believe if you lift weights, you can't move. But I found out that lift weights have nothing to do with your flexibility if you stretch while you lift it. As long as you stretch in that muscle, that muscle will get tight. In fact, then I'm a personal trainer here at the Auburn Writing City. I learned over the years that stretching is part of training. Cause it, it's for circulation. So when you stretch a muscle out, that muscle pump a lot easier. That, you can really, really pump that muscle uh, a, a, a lot easier if you got good circulation. Because what happens is when you pump in a muscle up, muscle cell, as you pump the blood in, the muscle cell expands. So keep expanding until you get this maximum. Then once you get that maximum pump, you want to keep it there. You want to keep it right there on that maximum pump. And it started to go down. And before it goes down, you pump it up again. After a while, the muscle will adjust. The muscle will adjust to what you're doing. And that's pretty much how bodybuilding works. There was a lot of guys that lift weights but didn't have the bodybuilding look like uh, Don Morocco. He had shoulders like cannonball, thick arms like tree trunk. But as you look, he wasn't defined because he, he lifted the weight, but he didn't do the diet. Then you had wrestlers that did steroids that never gained muscle, like Ronnie Piper. <laughs> he did the steroids, but he never got no muscle. Jake did a little steroids, but he never got he never got the muscle to go with it. Because I don't care what you take, protein powder, steroids, whatever you take, if you just did have to do the work. You still have to do the work. What the steroids did was, if you're able to work out for one hour without getting tired, the steroids helped you to work out two hours without getting tired. So you're able to put in more work by using the steroids. And that was the, and that was the difference. Which I'm not recommending anybody to do steroids. Back in my day, steroids were a lot safer. The reason they were safer, we didn't get them from some guy 
in the sitting in the locker room or uh, sitting in the gym. We got out from a doctor. You know, doctor would check you, tell you what you should take, what you shouldn't take. We do your blood pressure. So you had to go through a checkup first before they would prescribe anything of that nature uh, uh, to you. The best way to build up is to do it naturally. Because the same thing it takes to get something, it takes the same thing to keep it. So if you use steroids to get big, as soon as you stop taking them steroids, everything you built would disappear within a couple of months. See, I didn't use steroids to get to develop. I use steroids for competition only. Now, you're going to stay on the steroids for one month. But it takes a month for it to leave your system. So if I took steroids at the beginning of September, then, and I stopped at the beginning of October, the whole month of October is still in my system. So even though I'm not taking the pill, I'm still on the juice. Now, if the steroids are in your body for two months, if they're in your system for two months, you have to lay off, lay off four months, four months, and to give your natural hormones to kick back in. So the way I did it was two months on, four months off, two months on, four months off. So I only took it two months out of a year. No, two months out of a year. It stayed in your system one oh, month. Oh, I get Only you. took the pill uh, two months out of a year. Because the sucker, it, the sucker month, it stays in your system 30 days after you start taking it. It takes 30 days for your body to clear out. So even though you took it for one month, you are on the juice for two, even though you only took it for one month. So I want to take it two months out of a year. So for 10 months out of a year, Tony wasn't taking nothing. But I was on for four months, even though I only took it for two months. Because it stays in your system a month after you stop. Now you have to lay off twice the amount of time that you was on. So if you're in your system for two months, you have to let your system stay clean for uh, four months. That way you don't have any kidney problems, uh, you don't have any, well they call it steroid for a reason, you know what I'm trying to say, because you know, your test could be shrink, and it, because they're not producing, your body only produce what, what it needs. So if, 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 if your body don't need something, it won't produce it, you see? So that's why now, in my later, later years as a senior citizen, you know, I still got a little something going on here. Now, if I used the steroids to build up, I would have never, I would, wouldn't be able to maintain what I got, you know. I stopped using the steroids in 1988. So how many years that I've been off? 88. Uh, I stopped in 88. would be 30, so 33 years. 30, 33 years ago. I, you know, I've, I've been clean for 33 years before using a uh, steroid. And the good thing about it, in the nannies, uh, the, the early nannies, I set the main bench press bracket at 575, drug free. I did a lot of 500 pound benches, drug free. So everything from 1988 up until today was all drug free. And I feel good. You know, I, I don't have any kidney problems, any heart problems, or any of, 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 uh, of that stuff. I mean, I don't look like I did you know, back in the day or nothing, but right now I can walk in the gym, I can bench press over 300 pounds right now today. You know, my arms measure not no 23, but they're over 20 inches. You know, my body weight, I'm 265, 275 pounds. I work out four days a week. so. I, I don't miss it, but one of the things that kept me going for so, so, so many years were you fans.
And when I go to the arena or something, the fan look at me and say, oh, Tony, you look great. You keep yourself in great shape. A lot of times, you know, I don't want to go to the gym. But then I would meet one wrestling fan. They would tell me a story about watching me wrestle Huck Hogan or King Kong Bundy or wrestling with Jimmy Slipper or Rocket Soul Man Johnson. Then that would say, Tony, you have to stay in shape, if not for you, for your fan. You know? This picture up there, they were taken in 2006. That's 2006. So this is 15 years. 15 years ago. And 15 years later. Looking pretty good, my brother. 15 years later. Nothing changed. I got a little bit more grim, a little bit more uglier. <laughs> you know? I think my look comes from getting kicked in the face there. In fact, where that shoe girl at, Larry? It's over there. Hey, hey, young lady, I'm going to get this young lady going and kick me in the face there a little bit more, but I'm going to have a good old hair. This is my Christmas present. Y'all may think I'm weird. Y'all may think I'm crazy. And you got, you know something? You're absolutely right. Because right now, oh, right now, I'm going to get myself a little foot action going on here. And I don't want none of y'all criticizing me because we all got something that we like. You may like something that I don't like, and I may like something that you don't like, or vice versa. But you know what Tony had is like? See him pump? All you guys are over talking about my shoe fanny. This is the deal, baby. Look at that. Ain't that nice? This is going home. And boy, give it to me, girl. Boom, 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 boom. Oh! <laughs> Larry, what do you think about it? Think of old Larry. She ain't seen nothing like it. See, that's what Larry need. Larry need a woman to throw him on the ground and stomp him in his face. He need a good face stomping. You know, every man out there, if you don't let your wife stomp you in the face, you weird. But I want to thank all you guys. And Monty, thank you for giving me this great show. We still got eight minutes, Tony. We got eight minutes left, but I want to tell y'all a story about Andre the Jank. I don't know if I told this story or not, but I just want to tell it anyway. Andre, when you talk about strength, just strength, I know many about that strong. I mean, Mark Henry is the sucker strongest person I ever met. The sucker. Andre the first. Andre didn't go to the gym. He didn't work out. He just was so big, so powerful, so strong. I see Bill Eden at 275 pounds jump over the top rope. Andre catch him in the air, just like this. Just like this. Just like this. Like this. Throw it back in the ring. Oh my God. <laughs> Holy shit. Catch him. He coming over the top rope. Andre reach up and catch him. Bring him back like this. Throw him back in the ring. I see the guy scrape Andre car. Andre get get out of the car. The guy was stupid enough to pull over. Andre turned his car over. I seen Andre sitting in a Chinese restaurant. A guy keep messing with Andre. Andre eating his food. Not now, boss. Not now, boss. The guy keep messing with Andre. Hey, you don't look that tough. Andre do this, like you swatting a fly. Bam. Backhand the guy. Knocked him out. You ask anybody in the wrestling world who was the toughest wrestler the world ever saw. It was Andre the Giant. Now there was a story going around about Andre being afraid of Bad News Brown. Bad News uh, Brown was like uh, into martial arts and all the best stuff. Well, this is in Japan, and Andre wouldn't come up and ready to fight him. So I asked Andre later why y'all, you know, why didn't he fight the guy? Andre said, "I do not." Want to go to jail in Japan? <laughs> I do not want to go to jail in Japan. <laughs> you know, a lot of you know, we live in the greatest country in the world. The greatest country in the world. When you're in another country, 
Like, for example, Bruiser Brody. If Bruiser Brody had got stabbed to death in Texas, the outcome would have been totally different. But in Puerto Rico, it's not the same as in America. Even though they say they're part of America, it's not the same. Japan is not the same as America. Not even Canada is the same as America. In fact, Canada, I believe, is a little bit stricter. Yeah. Yeah, they're a little bit stricter. We were with, uh, I was riding with uh, Matt Hardy. Matt Hardy, Jeff Hardy. Matt and Jeff Hardy. And Matt got stopped for speeding in Canada. They took his license. So he was out of, out of you know, not from yeah. Canada. So what they do, they take your license. Now this guy's in Canada with a rental car, and he can't drive it. So you have to ride, ride with us guys. We have to give him a ride. They, they didn't even take your license right on the spot. So there, there's a lot of stuff that, that, that we do here that you can't do it. Like, for example, you can come to America on a visa. On a visa to come to America. And let's say the visa say you can stay here for two months. Where three months go by, nobody say nothing. Four months go by, nobody say nothing. Five months go by, nobody say nothing. A year to go by, five years go by, ten years go by. Nobody coming to check on you. I was in Japan and I stayed one day too long. They come looking for me. They come looking for you the next day, brother. Everybody don't have no illegal in, in these countries because the laws there. We got good laws here, but I don't think we enforce them. Oh, yeah. And I don't think you America really want them to really enforce these laws, you know. They got laws on the book, but our government is a lot leaner. A lot leaner. Like in Russia, you know they always talk about police brutality and stuff like that? Man, in Russia they would beat the crap out of you, throw you in the back seat of the car and you can't say nothing. I've been to countries like that where they would just drag your butt out. I was in Cairo, Egypt, and all the wrestlers would go to Egypt to promote and keep the passport. They do that so the wrestler can't separate in, in Cairo, Egypt. Well, I went shopping, and we'll come out there, they have roadblocks, just random roadblocks. You don't have to be no reason, they just do roadblocks. So they stopped, I don't have my passport. <laughs> the first thing they did, put a gun to my head, tell me to get on the ground, I laid on the ground, and the, and the other guy that was taking us around, he had to go all the way to the hotel, get my passport, come all the way back to prove who I was. All right, they weren't going to let me go. Wow. In Japan, when I lost my uh, uh, my passport, I had to, uh, uh, they, I got my passport. They wanted to give me my passport the day before, the day before you leave it, you know. So I got it the day before, but I'm leaving the next day. But it held me up. I couldn't get on the plane. They had to check all that out. Yeah. Did you see what I'm saying? Here, hey, you got your passport? Go ahead. So we get away with a, we got a lot more freedom than, uh, than what we think. I always look back about what if Tony Anthony was born somewhere other than America? Grown up in a one shack in the Freaking hills of the Alleghany Mountains, the Alleghany Mountains, with with cover of poor background, and to make it to WWE Hall of Fame. I believe I could be wrong. That only happened in America. That only happened in America. So me being Mr. USA, I'm very proud of our. Uh, be Mr. USA. I'm very proud of being an American. I'm glad that I got the right to vote. Everybody's equal now. In my opinion, there's only two things, two things in the world. Good and evil. There you go, brother. There's no Republican, no Democrat, no black, no white, no female, no male. We all American. We all got the same right the same opportunity. My success in life I owe to thousands and thousands and thousands of people. My failure in life I owe only to myself. 
One final thing before we leave, once again, thanks for having us at Celebrations. There's Tony and his best friend there. Thanks again for having us here at the Ramada Inn. It was a great time. Thank you to everybody that showed up, said hi along the way. This is my friend Tony. Tony. Cool. Cool. Master Clucci. There you go. Everybody have a great day. We'll see you at the matches when wrestling was real.